Welcome everybody. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Neuroscience of Addiction Part 2, the second of a three-part series running each Thursday through next week in September. Uh, September 27th next week is the last of the pieces that we've got. And my name is Joel Lonovitz. I'm the director of the Training Institute at NDRI, and I'll be your presenter today. So I want to special, put out a special nod of appreciation to Clyde Fredericks, our webinar organizer and administrative technologist, who's keeping the webinar running smoothly from a technological perspective. So today, I'll be talking to you about how the disease of drug addiction plays out throughout the different stages of recovery, focusing on specifically the early stages of recovery, when you'll be working mostly with our drug court participants. Um, just a reminder, this webinar is brought to you by the Bureau of Justice Administration, uh, BJA, Drug Courts Technical Assistance Project at American University over in Washington, D.C., um, in collaboration with us here at NDRI or the National Development Research Institutes. So let's um, take a look at some webinar logistics for those who have never been on a webinar before. For those of you who have seen this before, just hang in there and we'll get through them relatively quickly. Uh, what we've got hold on one second there we go there we go here's our webinar logistics so four tools uh, three tools that we have in one um, help spot the technical for te technical difficulties right the first thing you need to know is on the right hand corner is your control panel and you can see that right here right and you can access the control panel by using that orange arrow right there click it once and it'll disappear click it again it'll open up for you when I ask you questions or I say please text in an answer um, this is what you'll go to if I ask you to raise your electronic hand this is where you'll go to also We've also got the ability to ask questions um, and or to answer questions that I have for you. So you can see right here at the question box, you'll simply type in your, your response or your question and then click right here on the send button. It'll come right into me and they'll get lined up in a queue um, and I'll take them as soon as I can and I'll let you know when I'm answering or when I'm giving um, your responses. So that's questions. Uh, there's also the ability to raise your electronic hand. I just love that term. There's something about it which just, I don't know, electronic hand raising. Right? So you can see where it is. Do me a favor right now and everybody find that electronic hand and click it just so I know that you're here, that you've heard this. Um, since I have no physical audience response, I do have an electronic one. And I see hands going up across the board. Hopefully everybody's able to find that some of you are not raising your hands just go on over there and raise your hands excellent looks like I got most everybody even give me a percentage of hand raises that's really cool too um, I get lots of numbers in front of me on my screen all right so let's take the hands all down terrific Thank you. So that's hand raising raising your electronic hand in case I ask that that's how you do that and then last but not least if there are technical difficulties of some sort, um, you can call 800-263-6317. That gets you in touch with the Citrix folks um, who do the software go to webinar. Uh, so they'll help you if there's audio problems or some screen problems, and they'll help you figure it out right away so you can get back online with me. All right. So with that, then, let's go to... Uh, well, a little bit of information about me. I'm the director of the Training Institute at National Development Research Institutes. I've got over 20 years' experience in uh, drug treatment work, uh, not only as a provider, but also, of course, as a trainer of providers, and more specifically in the last decade or so, um, a drug court staff developers, and specifically in the areas of uh, drug treatment and, and the disease model. So let's take a look then at what we're going to cover today. Um, what we'll cover in part two is we're going to really take a look at um, the disease model within kind of the larger context of what is called the biopsychosocial, and then we add in these days the spiritual model. Right? We're going to take what we learned about neuroscience and the damage that's been done to the brain 
uh, to the process of drug addiction and see how it will present itself throughout the different stages of recovery. And we'll talk about what's called the developmental model of recovery as, uh, as a way to see these stages of recovery, just as we kind of talked about the stages of illness um, in part one. Uh, and of course, how this impacts on drug court and your work with drug court participants uh, and how you can then take this information and apply it directly. We'll see if we can do all that in our hour together. Um, so also, before I forget, at the end of the webinar, there will be an opportunity to fill out an evaluation. Please make sure when the webinar voice says the webinar is over, it will pop up on your screen. Please take a few moments to fill it out. It will take you only a couple of minutes and then send it back into us so we can collect evaluation information about your experience with this webinar also. So, a review from last time. Neuroscience supports that addiction is a brain disease. So we're not going to re rehash that information um, too much, but I do want us just to keep this in mind. Uh, and it's so important, I think we should all actually say it together. So let's all say this together. Addiction is a brain disease. All right, one more time. Together, addiction is a brain disease. Now, one time on your own, pretend I can hear you. If you're not laughing or chuckling, I'm not sure what else I can do. All right, so keep that in mind, addiction, brain disease, but it has, or that needs to be seen in biological, sociological, psychological components. So all throughout today, we're going to try to see how biologically, psychosocially, and even spiritually, how um, the disease then can be treated from different perspectives. Uh, so let's just remind ourselves then of these key elements. Right, that there is uh, the pathway for understanding addictive effects on drugs in the brain and behavior. It all takes place for most of the drugs that um, that our folks use right here, and what's called the reward pathway, right? Reward pathway, uh, where the neurotransmitter dopamine, in particular, is synthesized, sent on its pathway to the prefrontal cortex, where pleasure and other kinds of feelings, but especially the feeling of pleasure, right, um, uh, it occurs. Now, neurotrans the neurotransmitted dopamine also modulates the functioning of this area, the prefrontal cortex. And again, as a reminder, what's so important about the prefrontal cortex is that um, it's, it's sometimes called the executive suite of our brain and that it helps us to make decisions, it helps us with concentration, focus. It allows us the ability to say things like, in our minds at least, you know, on second thought, maybe I ought not to do that. So this on second thought thinking process, the ability to stop ourselves from maybe even impulsive behavior, is what a fully matured and functioning prefrontal cortex can do for us. Uh, the problem, of course, occurs in addiction and chemical dependency is that this reward pathway gets damaged. So it impairs the capability of individuals over time to feel, to have feelings, especially reward feelings, right? It impairs decision making, concentration, focus, and the ability to stop impulsive behaviors, right? Um, impairs. So these are what we call mitigating circumstances in our drug court participants, right? So this is what we're talking about again is addiction. Remember, there's use, abuse, addiction. There's this whole spectrum of illness. And addiction. Um, chemical dependency, when someone is chemically dependent, that's when this process is at its harshest and when we really have to uh, think in terms of how we're going to deal with the brain disease. So to the right here are these PET, cans, PET scans, so it's just to get a sense of what it looks like again on the right side here is damage to the prefrontal cortex. Right, your drug users have far less dopamine activity, which is what we're talking about right here. So it's a nice visual to see um, what we mean. PET scans again are positron emission tomography, kind of like MRIs in the sense that they give us scans um, of what's going on in the brain from a, a neurotransmitter perspective. So the question for us then is, and how we're going to have to deal with treatment is we, we need to know, is this damage permanent? Can treatment do something about the damage that occurs during dependency when this is, uh, has occurred? And so of course the answer is, is well, simple and not simple. The answer is no and yes. No, yes, yes, no, kind of both. Is the damage permanent? Sometimes it is. Um, but even when damage is permanent, when the ability to synthesize um, more dopamine uh, or the ability to have receptors that are fully functioning or to have enough of them um, 
other pathways in the brain can compensate for damaged pathways that can't be repaired. The problem is, of course, they may not be as good. They may not help you to function as quickly or in quite the same way. Uh, so that this is all par part of this process of what do we mean by, by treatment. So there is increasing evidence of brain recovery, yes, and we can see that with some scans in our next slide. Um, but remember, some drugs like, for example, long-term heavy alcohol use, uh, for that matter, long-term uh, methamphetamine use, uh, does result in some permanent damage to the central nervous system to the brain, to this reward pathway in particular. Um, uh, time frames for recovering areas uh, that have been damaged um, can be sometimes six months to several years, um, depending upon, of course, the drug itself, the type of damage it does, the amount of usage, any genetic vulnerability an individual already has uh, to this to substance uh, dependency, and of course the environment that they're in, because all kinds of external stimuli also influence uh, behavior and the ability for folks to to take actions. Right. So much can be restored. Um, you can also find new pathways. The problem may be that they may not be as effective as the original pathways. And this can be done, this treatment can be done biologically, psychologically, socially, and or spiritually. Um, so just remember, when we say not just biologically, but psychologically, socially, the majority of treatments that are out there that are evidence-based practices, for example, through NIDA, are, bio, are psychosocial treatments. Right? Um, that influence, of course, or that are, are brought to us through what we see, hear, say, do, um, even uh, experience. So you remember things like trauma, violence, uh, abuse, love, friendship, hanging out with people, hanging out in a bar, all these experiences are going to impact on a person's ability to recover, to recover damage to these pathways in the brain, and more specifically to the reward pathway. But we can recircuit them. We can find new pathways, even if they are damaged. So what this looks like, oh, before I forget this last point, uh, fundamental neurochemical imbalances that were there before the addiction um, may still need attention. So what does that mean? Just a, a kind of reminder that if someone uh, has a, a genetic vulnerability that is severe to substance use, uh, and that they have difficulty processing or creating or working with or modulating through the use of specific neurotransmitters. If they are, um, have, are deficient in serotonin or dopamine or something like that or have too much of it, um, these, this may still need to be addressed in some way, shape, or form, maybe even biologically with treatment for the rest of somebody's life. It really depends on all of these biopsychosocial factors. But keep that in mind. Some imbalances may not be able to be um, uh, completely re or balanced out uh, without outside intervention. So why is continued or long-term treatment critical? Let's remember to the left here you've got a normal brain and the red is the most number of dopamine transporters, right? Then it's yellow and then green uh, and that's the normal functioning brain. And then you see a meth user, for example, one month abstinent. You can see how they significantly reduced. This is reduced uh, ability to feel, reduced ability to be able to focus, concentrate, be able to modulate and utilize those prefrontal cortex uh, functions. And then you can say even 36 months later, so 36 months later, um, you've got a lot of it's repaired, but notice how it looks different. So when I said sometimes you can't have the actual pathway repaired and you need different pathways um, to compensate for them. You can see how that you know, in a very visual way occurs right here at 36 months. So even at 36 months, the things are different. They may not be exactly the same. So just think about how that's going to be for a drug court participant in trying to figure out what this means for them, how this is different, it doesn't feel the same way, how am I going to cope or deal with that? So this all points then to this idea of a disease model of chemical dependency. Remember, it's a disease of the brain. It's a chronic condition that requires lifelong management. We compare it to illnesses like type 2 diabetes, chronic hypertensive disease, asthma, or obesity, all of the above of which have a complex of physiological and behavioral health components. Um, 
all of which also have no one treatment episode that will completely resolve illness. Um, so that a course of dependency is usually multiple episodes of treatment, various recovery, recovery activities, relapse periods, small, short, long, um, and then back to recovery activities. So we're looking for periods of stabilization over time. So if we look at this then and start breaking it down into the biopsychosocial uh, spiritual model. Um, last time we talked about some of the reasons for starting drug use and I'm just going to take what you guys had written or sent in last week um, and break them down into bio, psycho um, and social and spiritual areas. Right. So for example, reasons for starting drug use, um, biologically increased energy, staying awake, weight loss, to relax, to sleep, uh, psychologically, Right, we've got to feel better, to medicate feelings, to escape from bad feelings, to escape from trauma that's occurred, increased self-confidence even, um, to medicate for mental illness that may have occurred, social reasons, we had talked about having fun, peer pressure, family that's um, using a culture that, that uses uh, in order to lessen inhibitions, for example, even to meet somebody, and then spiritually, We've got to feel more connected to a higher power if that's uh, part of where someone's at or to have what we call a spiritual sense of self. So those are reasons for starting drug use. Reasons for continued drug use over time, of course, we talked about from the perspective of dependency, right, um, including the drug itself and genetics, which are would all fall probably within, to, within the biological circle. So different drugs have different chances or risks of dependency over time, uh, some more than others. So for example, nicotine, heroin, crack cocaine, and alcohol are like the big four or five um, that have the highest risk with no other factors considered. And then there's the idea of genetic vulnerability, the idea that you have a family history um, so that genes may be uh, abnormal, there may be problems with neurotransmitter modulation or synthesizing so that you're more vulnerable if you use substances over time. And then, of course, the environment, which takes care of our um, psychosocial and spiritual uh, areas, like the community, peers, family, school, work. Um, so let's take a look then at one last area, and let me get you guys involved, around treatment approaches when looked at from a biopsychosocial spiritual perspective. So you tell me, what are examples? So go to your text box, open it up, your question box, and let's text in. What are some examples of biological treatments? Um, how would you consider, what would you consider to be biological treatments? Think in terms of uh, things that are physiological in their effect or biological in their effect. From what you know, send them in. And I'll wait for them over here, and as they come up, I'll let folks know. So someone wrote in naltrexone, uh, medically assisted treatment, MAT sometimes abbreviated as, any kind of medications, sure. Um, those would be biologically based, right? Examples of treatments, that would be biological. Uh, terrific. Let's move on to our next one. What about psychological um, or social treatments? So let's use, actually, let's, put, let's group them both together. Um, psychosocial treatments, so this is where the most of our NIDA-based, evidence-based evidence practices are listed. So what are the ones that you've been working with, just so I have a sense, but also tell me which ones you think are psychosocially based. Someone wrote relaxation techniques, uh, recovery support group interactions, uh, therapy, mentoring, any other ones that you guys are using. 12-step programs like AA, for example, sure. There is a certain evidence base for them also. CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, referral to therapists. Excellent. So let's do one more then. And this sometimes can be hot, uh, challenging. These days, uh, this fourth circle, the spiritual component, um, for those for whom this is, uh, can be important. Because remember, um, behavior, thoughts, all Anything that it comes in from the outside as an external uh, stimuli is going to be uh, have a chance to help direct pathways within the brain. So a spiritual component can be very powerful. Um, what would be a treatment that might be spiritually based, if you can imagine one? What do you think? And text, text in your, your responses. 
So take a moment to think about that. Ah, there we go. Meditation therapy, someone wrote. Religious organizations, someone wrote prayer. Um, to celebrate recovery, sure. Some folks would consider, for example, yoga, which is developing uh, slowly but surely an evidence base to be a, considered a spiritual practice. Excellent. So this is, these are examples of biological, psychological, social, spiritual treatments. Right? And each of them is going to address, in that sense, um, the reward pathway and to rework the pathways to, to help those dopamine receptors um, to be full, more fully functioning so that the prefrontal cortex can modulate itself better. So then what's the definition of give, given this then? What is our definition of recovery? And how is, how is that going to help us to see the stages of recovery? So we've got uh, an ongoing process of improving one's level of functioning. And of course, the theme we've got today from a biological, a psychological, a social, and a spiritual context. Um, all of the treatments that you just saw, the idea of the treatments that we just talked about and that we'll go further into as we go through, through this afternoon, um, are going to repair the reward pathway or make new adaptations to the pathways so that functioning can occur at a higher level. Keep that, those images from the PET scan um, and then from the um, other MRI scans in mind, you know, that we want to try to repair that pathway or make uh, adaptations or compensations so that we can still get to that front part of the brain and help it to function in a, in a more effective way. Um, before I forget, someone also wrote in uh, native rituals and or ceremonies okay, for a spiritual, so thank you for that. So of course, all these things in functioning better biologically, psychologically, socially, spiritually, while maintaining abstinence. Um, just want to add in one other aspect of a definition. The Betty Ford Institute came out with a, a definition where they included citizenship, which I thought was interesting and the concept of voluntarily maintained lifestyle. And citizenship they define as improved quality of social function as defined and measured by or scored on the social function, environment, and independent living domains of the World Health Organization's quality of life or quality of living scale. So that's interesting to me how that we have a citizenship um, uh, quality or, uh, or ability to be able to measure that too especially because of the work that we do, right? trying to think of community safety specifically. Um, so recovery, ongoing process. Ongoing, it doesn't just, one treatment episode doesn't occur and all of a sudden everything's better. All right, we've got multiple episodes of treatment changing over time depending upon the stage of recovery and depending upon what damage has been repaired, what still needs to be repaired, and then how that translates into our drug court participants' behavior, what we see and hear them do. Right? So let's take a look at then this developmental model of recovery. It comes from Terence Korsky. It's been around for a while. Um, I like this model because it's used by SAMHSA and NIDA as an example um, in their treatment, uh, their TIPS, Treatment Improvement Protocols, and TAPS, Technical Assistance Publications. Um, it's, a, it's a good model. It's a flexible model. The danger in using it is to become very rigid with it in either time frames or in step-by-step -step, uh, process, thinking everything has to move from one place to the next. There is overlap in the stages, and the time frames are simply reference points to give you an idea of where someone might be. Some people, again, depending upon uh, the drug itself, how long they've been using, um, how much they've used, their genetic vulnerability, uh, and the environment that they're in will impact on the length of time uh, that they'll go through each of these stages and how they will progress you know, slowly or quickly through each of them. Okay. Um, so you guys tell me first off, given these six stages, we've got something called transition, which I'll go over each of these in a, in a moment. We've got stabilization, and they, they kind of mean what they sound like, right, which occurs in the first zero to six months once you enter treatment. Early recovery, six months to two years. Middle recovery, another two to three years worth of middle recovery, and then late recovery in three to five more years, and then maintenance, which occurs afterwards. Um, you tell me, text in your answer. 
um, where are we working with our drug court participants? Which areas? What do you think? Where are we working in with them? Which stage or stages? I see one person says transition stabilization. Excellent. Early recovery. And there's a whole bunch of them coming in one after another. Excellent. Yep. Stabilization and early recovery mostly. In a sense, because this is drug court, we are uh, forcing transition in many ways. That's a, uh, even though it's not mandatory treatment, it is voluntary that people can choose to be in drug court or to do jail. Um, the concept of, of being placed in treatment as opposed um, to with no outside interference, right, going to treatment on your own. Um, it, it plays with the concept of transition, which we'll talk about in a moment. So yeah, mostly we're dealing with stabilization, early recovery. Uh, middle recovery, late recovery, all happens afterwards. Uh, that's what we maybe hear about later on. But the idea of, of not forgetting uh, middle, late, and maintenance, uh, those are other aspects that people will continue with. And the importance of, when looking at this from the disease model, of chronic illness that people need to be connected in some way, shape, or form to recovery activities throughout their lives, that that'll be very useful for them. Some more, some less, depending upon the factors that we've gone over already. Um, we need to always keep that in mind as, as far as the way aftercare works. Um, so remember, different drugs have different repair times. Uh, just as we have a spectrum of illness for a disease, we also have this spectrum of recovery. Um, remember, it's a flexible, not a static model. Um, and that what we try to do is, given this sense of, of time frame and of things that someone will go through, we then want to choose the correct treatment modality um, that, that will help someone move through these in the most effective way. So the first choice for treatment is treatment modality. Uh, in its most basic sense, you could think of inpatient, inpatient intensive, outpatient, outpatient intensive, longer periods, shorter periods. Right? Um, but those decisions first are going to tell us, uh, are we going to base on the intensity level of treatment that someone may need to help them move through, through these appropriately and effectively. And then it's what's on the treatment menu at that place. And those we want to try to titrate or match to what's going on in the brain and how it can most effectively repair, be, repair the damage to the brain at those time periods. So let's look at transition first then. So transition begins the first time a person experiences a drug or alcohol-related problem you know, with uh, us in the court, uh, with the law. Uh, maybe it can be from a hangover, some kind of social difficulty occurs. They show up late. They lose their job. Um, they get into a fight uh, because they're inebriated. This is when it begins. Whether or not it's recognized as a problem is another issue. Right? So one of the things that we look for is uh, the development of what we call motivating problems. Right? Um, it ends with identification of drug use in some way as problematic, even if it is, that's why I'm in jail, as opposed to, I have an addiction. And some of our, many of our folks may not even have an addiction. They may have a uh, diagnosis of abuse. Um, they may be using and selling. Right? Uh, so there's different ways to help motivate someone forward, but they don't have to say that they are an addict to be able to move forward into some of the next stages of recovery. Can it be useful? Yes. Do they have to? No, they can still move forward. Right? We know that mandated treatment uh, works just as well as non-mandated treatment. Right? Um, so there may be attempts at normal problem solving, maybe attempts at controlled use. There may be acceptance of the need for abstinence, and there may be acceptance of the need for help. Um, there may be. I did a whole bunch of focus groups here in New York with courts that will go unnamed. Um, and about 80 or, or 90 young, uh, young adults in treatment, mostly males, some females. Uh, and we asked them in these focus groups, at those, who, those who've been in about one to three months, do you think you have a problem with your uh, drug when you first were brought into uh, drug court. And those who have been in the program about one to three months said basically, you know, I don't have a problem. My problem is I got caught. Uh, we asked the same group and we've got different folks who now have been there in the program for about six months. And when they say, do you think you had a problem when you first got into drug court, they'll go, well, you know, it's still not a problem. It wasn't really a problem. Uh, but, uh, you know, I did 
get caught, and that's really the main issue that I've got here. And you know, the next time when I get out of here, I'm going to use my consequential thinking and not use when I'm selling because that's how I got caught the first time. And you got to give them credit for, for thinking up that. And you also got to give the treatment program credit for getting consequential thinking in the front part of their brain. And they are using that problem solving, maybe not for the best purpose, but still, that's a good thing. Right? So you got to look for the benefits when they come about. But it's really an interesting example of how the problem solving process can be aided and what can't occur at one month, two months, or three months starts to occur in some way, shape, or form at six months. And of course, the folks in the group who had been there 12 months right, and who did have an addiction problem or an abuse issue were saying things like, you know, I can't believe how messed up I was when I first got here and how much help I've had since I've been here. So just keep that in mind, you know, perspective based on how much time someone has had to repair damage can really be a useful thing for us as, as workers. So transition, that's I think for me is, was a really powerful way to see how transition occurs over time. And of course, when we get folks, they are in a sense transitioning because what's happened is they've been arrested and they're heading, they've decided to go to uh, because they're eligible, they've decided to go to treatment as opposed to jail. Um, so what we do then is we would use uh, some kind of evidence-based tool to help assess and figure out what's the best way to help them through the stages of recovery. What's the best way to help the participant through the stages of recovery so that they can repair any damage that's occurred to their brain uh, and be able to function more fully over time. Um, and the one I like to talk about is the ASM criteria, and you can really use any of them, but I'll just use the um, American Society of Addiction Medicine's six dimensions as a, just a sample of how you can address, again, from a biopsychosocial perspective, things like acute intoxication or withdrawal potential. Um, so this is like the basic question of does someone need uh, medical detox or can they do a detox on their own? Right? Do they need to have medical attention if they're, for example, addicted to alcohol, um, in which case you're concerned about seizures, or can they detox on their own um, because it was marijuana and, and they could. Uh, biomedical conditions, for example, what other physical problems do they have? Do they have diabetes, high blood pressure, family history of addiction? So you'll notice the higher the severity of any of these, the more likely that uh, the more intensive the treatment program would need. And intensivity goes from outpatient to inpatient and in its most basic way, right? So when we're talking about treatment modalities. Uh, emotional, uh, behavioral conditions, uh, is there a history of mental illness uh, like anxiety or depression? Uh, was there suicidal ideation? Is there aggressivity? So these are the things that we would factor in. Um, treatment acceptance, how motivated, what stage of readiness for treatment is someone in? Uh, have they completed, for example, the transition phase of recovery and say, I know that I'm I have an addiction. Um, what's their knowledge base around that? And how is it influencing their motivation? What's their relapse potential? Um, have they made attempts to quit before? Have they quit any other drugs like smoking? Um, so they have uh, a success to build from. Is there a family history? And then of course the last is recovery or living environment. What's the family environment like? Uh, what's the home community like? What's work, schools? If they're in school, what are their peers and friends like pro-social, anti-social, pro-drug use, anti-drug use? So these are the assessment tools that will help us choose the appropriate level of intensity, outpatient, inpatient, intensive, non-intensive, right? Amount of time that might be needed. All these things are going to factor then into uh, the treatment modality. And then from the treatment modality to the correct program that would have the specific interventions, um, such as cognitive behavioral therapy or motivational engineering, um, that would, mat would meet the needs of the brain disease that the individual has. So stabilization then, zero to six months. So stabilization is where we spend a lot of our time. And considering most of the relapse occurs within the first six months, there's a definite significant drop off after six months. A lot of work gets done in the first six months. Uh, so notice the difference between, for example, 
uh, acute and post-acute withdrawal. We'll talk about that a little more in a moment. Um, but the acute withdrawal is the physical withdrawal from a substance. And um, post-acute withdrawal is more psychological and social withdrawal. Right? It's more psychological. Um, acute can begin anywhere from six to eight hours after the last usage. And just to give you an idea of, of acute withdrawal and what that can mean. So for heroin, for example, um, you can usually withdraw from acute. Um, acute withdrawal can last three to four days. Usually you get seven days in detox um, or longer if there's a longer term problem or there are other extenuating circumstances. Um, and some of the, uh, of course, the physical symptoms we're talking about for heroin, for example, hypersensitivity to pain, sweating, vomiting, depression, muscle cramps, stomach cramps, chills. Um, uh, marijuana, by the way, I'm just using these two as an example. I think marijuana because a lot of people think that there are no, there's no withdrawal, there's no acute withdrawal from marijuana. Marijuana takes seven to 14 days uh, to get out of the system, but it can go up to up to 45 days depending upon all of these uh, factors we've talked about: usage, length of time, genetic factors, environment. Um, marijuana, uh, physical symptoms, irritability, restlessness, anger, outbursts, depression, mood swings, craving, headaches. Right. So then we talk about post-acute withdrawal. Um, this is after acute withdrawal, physical symptoms go away. We've still got other symptoms that are going to occur. And these are the challenges of working with uh, a brain that's been damaged through addiction. Uh, and so you may have things like mood swings, irritability, tiredness, variable energy, low enthusiasm, uh, variable ability to concentrate, disturbed sleep. So many of these, of course, have to do with uh, damage to the, for the ability to, of the prefrontal cortex to be able to modulate itself and its functions. Right? And you've got interrupting addictive preoccupation. I'll talk a little bit more about this in another slide. But uh, remember, the majority of the reward pathway is taken over by the need for, the use of, the craving for of the drug that's caused the damage. Right? So that means that you're thinking uh, a lot about how to get it, where to get it, uh, what it's going to feel like to use, and how much you need it. Right. Uh, part of the uh, job of stabilization is to help individuals create new ways to deal with this, to create new thought processes, and to interrupt this this uh, addictive preoccupation. So, short-term social stabilization, learning non-chemical stress management or coping skills, and, and it can take about six months. Right to master new skills. It's about six weeks to six months. So, at the minimum. You know, six weeks to six months to learn new skills, depending upon the biopsychosocial factors um, that someone has impacting on their illness. Um, this may take longer or less amount of time. Developing hope, of course, and then motivation is, is the last piece of this. So this is stabilization, where we spend a lot of our time with our drug court participants. Uh, Post-acute withdrawal, specifically for the criminal justice population, this is from SAMHSA's TAP-19. Um, so this is interesting for our population specifically. These are additional biological and psychosocial reasons for prolonged post-acute withdrawal. Um, increases in the length of severity uh, and in the length of the post-acute withdrawal period until that last image of the uh, meth addict's brain where the, passive, the pathways are more or less back in place. Um, where the number of receptors is similar to what, the way they were before addiction uh, had occurred. So for our folks, we're talking about, uh, from the biological perspective, if someone's a polydrug user, risk factors are higher. Right? Most of our folks are polydrug users. They're using cocaine and alcohol, heroin and cocaine. Right? So different combinations of substances. Uh, regular drug use before the age of 15, um, which, of course, uh, impacts on the ability of the brain to mature. Even though uh, a child's brain is more or less full size by about the age of 12, it then takes the next 14 years to fully mature. Um, and regular drug use before the age of 15 is going to impact on the ability of the uh, different parts of the brain, but especially prefrontal cortex, to fully mature. Um, 
we've got abusive use for a period of 15 or more years, so length of substance use. 15 years or more is another risk factor that's going to um, increase the severity and length of uh, the post-acute withdrawal and the healing of the brain. Uh, history of head trauma, traumatic brain injury, working with the veterans returning from the war with different uh, drug uh, dependencies, uh, and they may also have um, co-occurring head trauma that, from combat. And also, let's face it, a lot of our participants have it from living on the street, from the neighborhoods they live in, from violence they experience, um, family violence, uh, neighborhood violence, uh, history of trauma through fighting, through um, the use of weapons or being near them. Parental use of drugs uh, during pregnancy. Got personal family history of diabetes, hypoglycemia, addiction, uh, the individual being malnourished, these are all going to be further risk factors. Um, physical illness or other chronic pain, you can see how these tie into uh, the uh, choice uh, from the ASAM criteria also. It's, it's, it's interesting how they all kind of connect. And then if you look at the psychological and social, the psychosocial risk factors, you've got childhood or adult history of uh, psychological trauma, sexual and or physical abuse. So tell me this then, I'm going to just take a, a, a moment, think about what the numbers are for, uh, there's been a lot of research on, for example, sexual abuse of women in drug treatment. Um, what do you think the number is of women who are in drug treatment who have been sexually abused as children? Let's just take a moment, get a number in your head, and if you said below 50%, you're way off. If you said a little above, someone just wrote in 75%. Yeah, the numbers uh, of the studies that I've seen, there's been a lot of them. Someone just wrote an 80%. Excellent. They're actually between 70 and 95%, depending upon the program that was looked at. Uh, so this is tremendous numbers. Now, here's a question for you. How about for uh, men? Sexual abuse of men when they were uh, children. What are the numbers for them? The type of men? I see someone wrote 75, a little high. It's got to be below, it's going to be below 50, but it's not going to be below 10%. Numbers are around, right, someone just wrote in 30, 30, 35, 40. Those are the numbers that, that I've seen in a lot of the studies. And I think that that's a lot higher than the folks that, that, were, that we would assume or think um, has happened. And, of course, a lot of that kind of information comes out to us very late in treatment or after folks have left treatment completely. Uh, mental illness or severe personality disorders is going to, uh, again, Another risk factor, high stress lifestyle or personality, a high stress social environment, not that any of our drug group participants have stress or a stressful social environment at all. Okay, that was a joke. So let's look at this concept of addictive preoccupation. This is, these are all the, the things that are being dealt with, especially in the stabilization period. We've got obsessive thought patterns, um, and we're going to talk much more about this in part three when we go over relapse, how neuroscience and relapse kind of work hand in hand. Um, compulsive behaviors, right? behaviors that are automatic, that are not being influenced by the on-second thought decision-making capability because there is limited or impaired capability to do that. Physical cravings, uh, these things are all these obsessive thoughts, compulsive behaviors, physical cravings, they're activated by what we call high-risk situations and stress, including the famous people places and things. Right? So these are the external stimuli that when come into our brain, we see them, and because of the addictive patterns that are established, we act in compulsive ways and not necessarily helpful or healthy ones. So early recovery then is our 6 to 24 months, and it can last anywhere from 1 to 2 years long, and this is usually where we see the last of our folks, right? So what do they need? They need some understanding of addiction and what's going on in them, in their, in their bodies and in their brains. They need to be able to recognize what addiction is. Overall, you could say the mark of early recovery is the need to establish a chemical-free lifestyle. So you stabilize by giving new, new coping skills in stabilization, but in early recovery, we really want to establish a chemical-free lifestyle that's that's, in a sense, in the laboratory of treatment reinforced so that new pathways are firmly established in the brain, right, that, that uh, damage has been repaired to a good extent. Identifying and interrupting addictive thoughts, feelings, and actions, learning non-chemical coping skills, um, ways to 
uh, use the body's uh, natural opiates like uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine. Developing a sobriety, actually going back to that last one, a very simple way, this is just kind of a, a nice aside, but it's an interesting one, a simple way to, to induce the body's um, natural opiates is simply to smile. You don't even have to really want to smile. If you smile, you automatically secrete some and start that process in the reward pathway. It's really an interesting process. Also, as human beings, we have a mirror reflex. If you smile at someone, they will automatically smile back at you. They cannot help it. As a student of body language, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, also, if you've got an enemy that you really don't like and you smile at them and they smile back at you, okay, it'll make your day. Trust me on this. So let's work with that. So developing a sobriety-centered value system, back on track. Um, so these are early recovery, 6 to 24 months. And then we've got middle recovery. And what's the task of a middle recovery? Well, it kind of begins with coming to terms with the amount of work that there still is to be done, it's sometimes called the demoralization crisis. All right, demoralization crisis. I've gone this far. It's been a couple of years I've been in treatment. I went through drug court. I'm back out. I've got to now take the skills I learned and apply them to real life situations full time. And you know, you realize I, I, I messed up a lot when I was high. I messed up a lot when I was using. Uh, there's damage that's been done to my family, to my friends, uh, to my children maybe, to my parents, uh, maybe to my partner or spouse. Uh, and now I have to work on that sometimes called the demoralization crisis. It can be hard to think, I still have more work to do, because we know that treatment is hard. Our treatment is not easy to do, uh, which is why sometimes people say, you know, treatment is so hard, I'd rather go to jail, right? Because we've never heard that before. Repairing addiction caused social damage, is what we've been talking about, and this idea of not only building, but then practicing a balanced lifestyle. So this usually happens after our folks leave. Right? It's part of aftercare and what the needs are around aftercare. And then we've got late recovery, which occurs again even past here. Really the whole thing about late recovery is to deal with unfinished business from childhood. Uh, this gets very psychoanalytical, I know, but work with me on this. This is when folks deal with, for example, um, childhood violence, sexual abuse, these kinds of things. Now what happens is this may come up in early recovery or during stabilization. Uh, you just may not want to go full force into dealing with someone's issues like that that early in recovery because it can be a real trigger for a relapse. It doesn't mean you may not address these things earlier in recovery. You just won't address them in the same detail or to the same intensity because we're trying to build a firm base, stabilize, practice, and then integrate into life. Um, Recognition that childhood issues are affecting the quality of recovery. Learn about family of origin issues and how these may need to uh, play themselves out. Conscious examination of childhood. Um, identification of self-defeating patterns that, or maladaptive patterns that may have been helpful in survival as a child, but not so helpful later on as an adult. And then, of course, figure out how does this apply to adult living. That's late recovery. Um, maintenance, then. So maintenance, maintenance. Lifelong process, this is what happens after. It really has to do with coping with life, uh, life occurrences and transitions that are going to occur and that will be challenges to someone's recovery process. And that can include um, maintaining recovery program, effective day-to-day -day coping, continued growth and development in the face of things like uh, birth, uh, death, divorce, marriage, getting older, not necessarily getting younger, uh, illnesses, all the things that occur and help transition life from one stage to the next outside of um, the world of recovery. So continued growth and how, they, that we, and how we can grow and develop from them. So coping with life trans, transitions and complicating factors. So that's maintenance. So now let's take this in our last um, uh, 12 minutes or so and see how that's going to apply. I'll give you some examples. I'm going to use the work of um, Richard... Uh, Rawson over in California on stimulants because number one, I think it's really good and I think it's, it shows us how we can apply specifically to the, to the ways to repair damage from brain disease um, with very specific examples. Uh, so stimulants in general, methamphetamine in particular, I'll use um, with these examples. But remember, as I go through, I'll try to give other examples just so you have a sense of it. Um, I don't have time to go through all five or six different drugs. So we'll use one as an example for all. So if you look at this, uh, Rawson's work, 
here's stages of recovery for our stimulants, just an overview, right? And withdrawal stage, so he has a zero to 15 days. This is acute withdrawal from physical symptoms, right? which means some of the problems or challenges that will occur during the first 15 days may be the medical problems that have been masked by the use of the drug uh, or that have been caused by the use of the drug. There may be alcohol withdrawal because it may be a poly drug that's being used. Uh, there may be depression, um, uh, difficulty concentrating, severe craving. Uh, there may still be contact with stimuli, people, places, and things. There, someone may sleep a tremendous amount. So that's withdrawal stage. The honeymoon stage is what happens uh, from 15 days to 45. So this is post-acute withdrawal begins. Um, and that they may not actually feel very much of that at first. What happens in the honeymoon stage is you feel so good because, you know, you made it through detox and with the acute withdrawal, and you're like, hey, that was easy. It's done. It's only a couple of weeks, and I feel better. So what are the problems? Well, you may get over-involved with work. The participant may be overconfident in their ability to, um, to remain abstinent, or they may think, well, I can use a little bit. It's not going to be that big a deal. There may be an inability to initiate further state change, to move any further. Ah, this is enough. I can't go any further. There may be challenges in prioritizing. You notice how that uh, impacts prefront prefrontal cortex. There may be alcohol use comes back into the picture. Again, episodic cravings. Someone may leave treatment. Um, and then there's this thing called the wall stage. So when the symptoms come back and it feels significantly worse in many ways than the withdrawal did all by itself and it lasts a long time 45 to 120 days um, there may be inertia boredom depression uh, return to cocaine use uh, or being around stimulus because you figure you could take it during the honeymoon stage now all of a sudden you can't so there may be justification in an individual's mind to relapse um, there may be uh, treatment termination, there may be alcohol use, and of course relapse. Two things, these are quotes from clients who were in the wall phase, and this is what they said. Um, lack of energy was almost constant, even if I slept for hours. Lack of memory, inability to concentrate, and the gray film over my vision clouded my world. My sleep became mixed up. I would be dead tired during the day and experience insomnia at night. Someone else said, throughout the wall, I didn't care about anything or anybody, including myself. Nothing seemed important. Nothing felt good. Boredom, hopelessness, my constant companions. I felt the whole thing would never end. So I think from the perspective of what goes on with, with our participants, um, those are two interesting quotes to help inform us. Uh, so I'm not going to go any further than that on this chart, um, but let's take a look at when we say what's going on with the brain. This is an interesting chart from Rawson's work on not just the frequency of impairment, uh, but percentage of impairment that occurs. And you'll see for fluency of the executive systems functioning, for example, and learning and memory you've got for methamphetamine and stimulant users as high as 35 to 55 percent impairment, inhibition 20 to 25 percent, attention psychomotor speed 20 to 25 percent. These are Im percentage impairments. So this translates then into uh, deficits on the prefrontal cortex executive tasks associated with poor judgment, lack of insight into behavior, the inability to say on second thought I ought not to do that, poor strategy formation, impulsivity, reduced capacity to determine consequences of actions. So then what do we do to, to treat this? How does it translate, for example, into treatment? So treatment for methamphetamine may include these areas. Right. Um, from a biological, psychosocial perspective. Right. First, from a biological perspective, bupropion is used in a, in a number of places. Uh, it's an antidepressant. Research has shown some help with reducing the high and decreasing craving for methamphetamine addicts. Right. Psychosocial interventions, cognitive behavioral therapy, and CBT, by the way, also used for as evidence-based for alcohol, marijuana cocaine, nicotine. Motivational interviewing, which I know we hear a lot of, has a good evidence base also for alcohol and marijuana. Contingency management, 
which is giving rewards. So really think about this. I just love the concept of contingency management. Giving rewards immediately when someone does something that you want them to do. Rewards immediately, not waiting a day, two days, a week later, but immediate rewards. And think about how that impacts on the reward pathway, creating new ones for positive behaviors. Right? Twelve-step facilitation uh, therapy also used for stimulants, opiates, alcohol, and of course the matrix model of outpatient treatment is used specifically for uh, opiates and has a, a nice evidence base to it also. So this is a, these are treatment interventions. Let's look even more specifically, uh, even on a more micro level as to how you can address specific elements of brain disease. Educate clients about the reality of, for example, methamphetamine addiction. Employ varied adult learning formats to increase comprehension and retention of knowledge in view of cognitive deficiencies, especially verbal memory problems. So if you know that people have trouble taking verbal instructions, then you're going to need to do things like provide workbooks, learning aids on relapse prevention for clients to take with them into continuing care. So they're going to need to have them with them as reminders. If the verbal information is having difficulty through impairment of being received and understood because of the cognitive problems of long-term uh, uh, addiction, then these are, the, these are ways to help someone compensate, to have compensations that specifically address brain disease. Other ones, strategies to reduce anhedonia, which is the inability to feel pleasure, right? specifically related to the problems with the reward, um, reward pathway. And negative mood states, uh, episodic paranoia, sleep problems. So how do you deal with that? Here's four tools which have different types of evidence base, right? Aerobic exercise to um, promote the natural uh, uh, neurotransmitters, which will lift mood. Um, yoga, for example, has some evidence base to this. Tai Chi, meditation. So you can see how these are being specifically tailored to these symptoms. Anger management strategies to cope with possible serotonergic dysregulation, induced irritability, and groups to address extensive maladaptive sexual behaviors and expectations. So groups that will talk specifically about the issues to help people address behaviors and find new pathways in their brains to be able to deal with them, right? To help exercise and focus, refocus them so that compensations and adaptations can be made on the and brain pathways. Uh, and with that, it's kind of a way to close out. Uh, this is from Rawson's work again. Some of the outcomes with amphetamine users, he, just this call uh, of alarm to keep in mind of after our drug guard participants leave, what are some things that we can do to help them? Or how can we set them up to succeed outside of drug court? And he says the single most important factor for positive treatment outcomes uh, will be the degree to which clients are retained in post-residential treatment. Use community care organizations with a continuum of care that can decrease and increase intensity of care when clinically indicated. So the idea to be flexible depending upon how treatment of the brain is going. Create treatment plans that maximize compliance by addressing clients where they're at uh, through full assessments which tell us how, what the risk factors are and, and what the appropriate modality and interventions will be for them. Employ positive reinforcement. Remember, positive reinforcement uh, promotes pathways in the brain significantly um, more effectively than negative reinforcement. We know positive reinforcement works better, but we're very, very stingy with it, right? So remember that. Um, it's the basis of contingency management is an evidence-based practice. Um, coordinate parole monitoring and treatment participation in community care make mental health care available, and last but not least, involve family and community care services. And you can see how these can be utilized for other substances just as well. And with our last couple minutes then, let me throw it open for um, questions. We've got a couple minutes, uh, two or three to be exact. So let's see if we've got some questions as we move into our closing. So if you've got a question, open your question box, text me it in, and let's see what we get. While I'm waiting for question or questions to come in, let me remind you all that next week will be the third and final um, piece on addiction and neuroscience of the brain, where we'll talk about relapse specifically, looking at uh, uh, cravings, acute preoccupation, um, et cetera. And in the meantime, I'm still waiting for another question. Let's see if we have one.
Okay. So if there are no questions, let's move on to our last piece, which is to uh, remind everyone when we sign off in about 30 seconds to please uh, fill out the survey for today's uh, workshop, um, your evaluation survey, and then send that right back in. Uh, so someone did finally get in the question, will you cover anything related in, in incentives and sanctions connected to the presentation? Yes. Uh, next week when we talk about relapse and how that's going to play itself out, we'll talk about sanctions and incentives um, as we look at how brain disease influences relapse and how we as drug court practitioners need to be able to deal with it from an appropriate perspective. Right? So yes, so thank you for that question also. Um, again, thank you for participation. Fill out the survey when we sign off. Uh, thank you Clyde Frederick for our administrative technologist for keeping everything running smoothly from a technological perspective, and I hope to see you all next week.